Hi, y'all. This is Kristen Chenoweth. Hi, I'm Gloria Stefan. This is Sarah Bareilles. Hi, I'm Patty Lapone. This is Lynn Manuel Miranda. You're listening to the Broadway Podcast Network. Hello there, you fancy podcast listener. Welcome to another all new episode of The Theater Podcast. I'm Alan Seals, and we have two guests for this episode today Cecily Strong, who you most likely know from her decade on Saturday Night Live, and one of her current co stars, Andrea Saglowski, two amazing women playing equally amazing characters in a new play called Brooklyn Laundry, which is at the Manhattan Theater Club here in Midtown, New York. Interestingly enough, the show itself revolves around a cast of four who are are all grappling with middle age and their internal struggle of trying to be good enough, I put in air quotes, and as fate would have it, art imitates life. The three of us in this episode got into a conversation about pretty much exactly that, the two of them being successful in their careers, yet still wondering if the choices they've made are are good enough. So before we dive in, make sure to find me online, Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, threads, etc, etc, etc. Now, everybody, please enjoy this incredibly insightful episode with Cecily Strong and Andrea Saglowski. We are lucky enough to have two guests today, both starring in the current production of Brooklyn Laundry at the Manhattan Theater Club. Andrea Siglowski was last seen in Dig at Primary Stages with additional stage credits that include Broadway's Passover, one of my favorites of that season, Off-Broadway's Halfway Bitches Go Straight to Heaven, and Queens, in addition to a giant swath of regional credits that if I read would keep us here all day. Mm -hmm. TV credits include Evil, New Amsterdam, Blue Bloods Elementary, and How to Get Away with Murder, and The Good Wife, all of my favorite shows. Cecily Strong is best known for her work as a cast member on Saturday Night Live from 2012 to 2022, which garnered her multiple Emmy Award nominations, was most recently seen on Apple TV's hit musical series Schmegadoon, in addition to film credits that include The Female Brain, the recent Ghostbusters reboot, as well as Melissa McCarthy's The Boss, The Bronze, and The Meddler. She made her New York stage debut in 2021, hasn't looked back since. Together, Andrea and Cecily are 50% of the four-member cast of Brooklyn Laundry, an amazing world premiere play written by Tony and Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Patrick Shanley. Woo! Andrea and Cecily, mm. welcome to the Theater Podcast. Oh, thank you for having us. I hope, uh, I hope we did that justice. What an intro. There we go. Wow. I'm, I feel great about myself today now. In the podcast here, we always like to start back at the beginning of um, what got you into performing and, and interested in the in acting, what made you have the bug? So, Andrew, I, let's start with you. Flip the coin backstage. Boom. Heads, you're first. What got you into performing? Oh, you know what? I um, I think a couple things. But mostly I grew up in a, a in Delco outside of um, a, a town outside of Philadelphia, which is now famous because Mayor of East Town takes place there. Um, and there wasn't a whole lot to do. Uh, and <laughs> Cecily and I have a lot in common, or as you'll probably learn as, as we talk today, but, um, I saw a production of Our Town at this small theater called Hedra Theater, which actually is one of the first theaters founded in the United States of America. Um, and I loved it. I just, and I knew like, even before I ever spoke a word on stage, I just knew I was going to be an actor and I just, uh. Yeah, I just decided, you know what, that's what I'm going to do with my life. And then that's what I went and did. Was um, it the, the singing, the acting, the attention? Like everybody kind of gets at it for a different no, reason. No, I'm just like, as Cecily will, will, will probably can say, I, I'm just like an emotional creature. And I just, we both, can I say this, Cess? I, we both see. really liked the Titanic. <laughs> We grew up at a time where the Titanic. No, I wasn't. Like, a, no, no. Okay, Titanic no. wasn't mine. Romeo and Juliet. Romeo and Juliet was Cecily's, but we loved Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, and I really wanted to fall in Let's love. Let's set the record straight. Let's set the record straight. Okay, <laughs> I was a Titanic girl. She was. We we grew up at the same time. She was a Romeo and Juliet girl. I loved Leonardo DiCaprio. I wanted to fall in love. I loved Romeo and Juliet too. I just loved everything about it. I just wanted life to feel bigger than it felt in my small town. Well, first of all, why is it a secret that you love Leonardo DiCaprio? Are you both? Let's dive into the shame that obviously accompanies know, right? this. 
I don't think we were the only ones in no. 1997. No, every girl I dated, I was competing with with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> well, that's awful. Who would? That's that's too tough. <laughs> yeah, I always lost. <laughs> I mean, he was my first love because of Romeo and Juliet. Right. That's why I was like, oh, I know what love is now. It's what I feel. It's devastating. I sobbed in the bathroom of the Lake Theater in Oak Park. So, Cecily, then, you were also in a small town in Illinois, I want to say? Yeah. Well, I don't know if it should be called a small town. It's I grew up in Oak Park, which is just the, the green line's end of the train in Chicago. Frank Lloyd Wright, Ernest Hemingway, Kathy Griffin, Dan Castellanata, uh, Betty White. John Mahoney. These are all other Oak Parkers that I've learned. I was just like a weird kid. I would perform, I was, would sing weird songs when I was three. And my parents were like, we'll put you in a drama class. We don't know what this is going on with you. So let's try that. <laughs> and I, and Oak Park is a very like liberal, progressive town too. So I went to a preschool called Suburban Child Development Center and they had a drama class. So I started then and then I did community theater in Oak Park. My first role was Ruthie Jode in The Grapes of Wrath and I was eight and Ruthie was 12. So I was like, clearly I'm very mature. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and then uh, and then I, I did equity theater in Chicago. I, I did a show at the Goodman when I was going into seventh grade. So I was like a child theater actor. And then I went to school. I got my BFA in theater from CalArts. And then it was comedy that came later in life. Um, I didn't start taking improv classes till after I graduated. I had a teacher at CalArts who was like, you should tr take a class at the Groundlings. And I was offended at first because I was like, excuse me, I'm a serious actor. Uh, <laughs> and then... I, did, I took a class at the Groundlings and I loved it. And I, I didn't, I felt like LA was not the scene for me after graduating. I was like, I don't know how anyone navigates this. I feel like I'm up against like actual models. And I'm like, I where I, I just played Rosalind. And now I'm like begging. To, I'm like, do I have to go on dates with old producer? It was just all like gross and ick. And like, this is not how this is going to work for me. And I moved back to Chicago and I took classes at Second City and IO and sort of got into that world. Well, I love that you said you were a weird kid because weird kids grow up to be weird adults. And some of the best people on TV and film and theater are weird adults. So yeah, yes. lean into that and embrace it because um, I just, oh, I, I love, I love all of that. And well, you said you were a serious actor. That reminds me, um, Big Ange, you went to Juilliard. You are a serious actor as well. Yeah. And I went the serious. The, she is the actor. <laughs> That's stupid. She is like the most actor of no, all people. No, no. And I'm sorry to interrupt because I have to tell this story because Ange at one point was like, I don't even know. I don't know that I see myself as an actor or something. And we were like, excuse me? <laughs> you are the most, you are an acting coach. You are, you talk about everything like from an actor's perspective. Like how would an actor approach this? <laughs> she, is such, she is the most actor of any actor I've ever met. Oh my met. God, my face is so red. Um, yeah, Cecily out of me. But you know what? This is a fun fact about Cess and I. When she was at CalArts, the same four years, I was at the University of Southern California. And she was smart because somebody was like, you should take classes at the Groundling. And she was Groundlings. And she mm -hmm. was like, I, I'm, a, I'm a serious actor. But she went and did it. And then she was on SNL for 10 years and made a whole lot of money. And I was like, I'm a serious actor. And then I went to Juilliard for four years and spent more money on training <laughs> and now make the big bucks in the American theater. No, so... Well, let me just tell you something. Just let me crush a lot of dreams here. SNL is <laughs> not the money-making <laughs> machine everyone may think it is. That's the commercials, honey. You do commercials. Right, 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 right. That's the right, right. We're, we're talking about getting a, I have to get a branding. Andrea yeah. Sigrowski, the most actorly actor selling you, you an actor, Evian. Yes. <laughs> no, I, I did. I went to Juilliard and I, I am really grateful. I had great training and great teachers and most and everything. It, like People come out of that school and they work and they're really good. 
you know, even Cecily and I have a mutual friend, Gail Rankin, who's going to be in Cabaret on Broadway, which is the most exciting. I'm, I'm most excited to see her in that. And Oh, yeah. Can't wait. Yeah, no, I, I was really fortunate. And um, I loved my time there, truly. A lot of people call it the jail yard, you know? Why? Um, because be- do, you, do you come out sort of overqualified? Is it, like, what is... I mean, can you be overqualified for... No, for, no, for I don't... Some people think you can. I mean, my, I remember I had a teacher in undergrad who was like, don't go to Juilliard. They're just going to ruin you. They're going to ruin you. And it was like, the idea was like, you know, you're going to get too much training and you're going to be like a robot. And that's the opposite, I think, of what I do for sure. And what a lot of people do that come out of that school. I also was there during a very specific time when Jim Houghton, who unfortunately uh, passed away, I guess, seven years ago now. He ran that school for seven years, and he also ran the Signature Theater Company. Mm -hmm. He loved playwrights. I mean, Brandon Jenkins, and Brandon was there. Josh Harmon was there. Molly Smith Metzler was there. There was just like amazing writers and amazing actors all working together, and and Jim cultivated those relationships. When you get into a real conversation about creating a character with someone who takes it very very seriously they don't think it's they don't assume it's just showing up and easily throwing words out in front of a camera like it the amount of depth cecily does too she is a serious serious actor even though she's throwing that at me i'm gonna throw it right back at her because she doesn't have a dishonest moment ever oh no ever and i want to bring this completely to brooklyn laundry because it's a side of of cecily that I'm calling her Cess now. Excited. We don't, we're Cess now. We're Cess. Okay. I call her Cess. I'm sorry. Big, big Ange and Cess. Um, yeah, it's a side of, of Cecily that, of course, we're not used to on the general public. Um, but uh, so I, I promise I will get there because it, Brooklyn Laundry, both of your performances, just absolutely phenomenal. But um, to finish to finish my original thought, um, when did, did you feel like coming out of Juilliard that you were overanalyzing or did you kind of or were they talking to you about any of that about like you still have to be really stuff to be yourself? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, uh, no, the acting training is trying. I think the training is there to try to to get you to tell the truth and to tell the truth so that you're transformational so that you're not playing yourself all the time. I am certainly nothing like this character in Brooklyn Laundry. Really, I mean, there are maybe Cecily mm-hmm. will disagree, but um, no, I, I don't think. I, and I think like the best thing that Richard Feldman said at Juilliard was that the training is there when you are uninspired. Oh. The only way you go to the tools is if you need them because you're stuck. But if you're extremely gifted and like Viola Davis went to Juilliard, right? And she had an undergrad degree. She's like incredibly gifted, right? So she's not, she's not gonna, I don't think she's gonna use the tools unless she really has to. Um, mm. And I think that's what that's there for. And also you play like a million different parts when you go to a school like CalArts and a, a BFA program or at Juilliard, you, SNL. I mean, come on, Cecily's played every single dialect, every single role. So when something's asked of you, you've already done it in like a, another setting. So you're like, feel a little bit more confident. I just lacked confidence. Juilliard gave me confidence. That's interesting. That's really interesting. Okay. And I guess, yeah, the more you do something, the more confidence you should get behind it. And and it propels you forward. That's a, that's a really good uh, way to look at, at that sort of thing. And yeah, so Cecily, I guess... You didn't want to do comedy, it sounds like, at first, or you didn't think you would be good at it because you're like, how dare you? I'm a serious actor. Yes. Well, I felt it was like, right. It just, or I was sort of like, listen, I do, I'm a comedic actor. That's fine. But to like go do that specifically when I was like, I like drama too. But improv, listen, Cal Arts also was had real hippy dippy avant garde, like Wooster Group, Stacey Dawson, you know, a lot of movement, gesture work, puppetry. So that was, I felt like that led in more naturally into improv and um, and sketch comedy and improv. And a lot of people at Second City, and you, they'll tell you like that training. It's the confidence there. It teaches you how to fail. Like you go on stage, there's like, okay, the worst that can happen is like, I'm going to make something up and it's going to eat shit. And 
and I fail. Mm -hmm. And you can do that every night. And then you're like, okay, I know what it is to fail. I know what it is to like not succeed on stage. And I survived it and I'm okay. And it's sort of, so there's, there's that way of gaining confidence too. That's really, it's, it's cool. Um, yeah, I was just heard the other day that, you know, standups, right. Um, when you go out and you do sets that just bomb or you do things that just bomb over and over again, that you get a heckler and that's like, that's gives you something to work with because now you're pushing forward through something fun and the worst that could happen, you bombed, that's already happened. You're used to it. You've got such thick skin that that's just part of the job. And, and there's so much in like, I went to like auditions throughout life that are just so humbling. I feel like I'm humbled constantly and that's what you get used to. And just like corporate gigs where you're like, this is, I would be humiliated if I hadn't already gone through this humiliation before. <laughs> and it's just like, let you go, let go and let God, I'll get a paycheck at the end of it. But you know, it's like, we have to do a lot of things that you don't feel great about. So it is such, a, it's a huge, it's a huge payment. I'm using quotes to get to do a show that you that feels this good that feels meaty with working with other actors that feel like I, I said this before and I'm going to stick with this for a while until I stop but it's like what I imagine like a great tennis game would feel like like where you get to p play with another person that you really respect you know like the I, I feel like that would probably feel like what it feels to me to like work with this cast hang on everybody we're just gonna take a quick break all right, now we're back. I mean, the play itself is so, it's so cool. And I walked away with uh, just trying to make a list of everything I was thankful for in life. This subject matter, and I don't want to give too much away. It's like really bad things happen to really good people. And there's nothing in life we can do about it. We just have to deal with it and move on. And I love how it's presented. And Cecily, especially, you're the, you're, you're the through line um, we're following you as the audience. We're following your story through the whole thing. And just the, the humanity that is brought to, to this character of, of Fran, your character of Susie too, everybody just, they want to live. They want to survive. They want to be happy. And they're just dealing with all of the shit that keeps getting thrown at them in the best way that they can. And I feel like coming out of COVID, coming out of the pandemic in this new age we're in, there's a lot of parallels into what's happening in, in real life. So the two of you approaching these characters, did, did you, I mean, Andrea, did you have to go back to the tools or were you literally inspired by like, I just went through something similar in COVID and we, and we lost our industry and all this. And, you know, Cecily, you coming into the, coming back into the serious, I put in quotes, serious acting world mm -hmm. after leaving SNL in 2022, like both of you coming into this, was that hard or easy? Well, Cecily, do you want to go first, honey? Uh, sure. I feel like there's a couple questions, I think. I, I tend to I ask say... a lot of compound questions. I'm sorry. No, Again, no. Let me tell you something. My brain tends to get confused easily. So we're a good combo, <laughs> you and I. Um, <laughs> I think, listen, I, I think the things that I really felt immediate connection to was you know, with Fran sort of being 30 steps, feeling like I'm at a, she's at a rut in her life anyway. And I feel like there is, I have a lot of, especially maybe it's the business I'm in. I have a lot of friends. We're a lot like late thirties, early forties, and still not quite like not, not the way people were in their late thirties and early forties, 20 years ago. It's sort of like, we don't have kids. We're not married. We're like, what have I done with my life? I focused on this. I don't know where my life, is. and then COVID happened and it stopped everything. And we lost three years. And maybe it's like, I do feel a little silly or selfish saying we lost it, but I'm just going to say that and, and hope you know what I mean by that. But just sort of, there's just an arrested development thing, and then not knowing what to do. And then there is, she really is, you know, her oldest sister gives her this advice that moves her. That's like, here's what you take your life by the reins, go, you know, she's inspired to do that and is going to try to do that for the first time. And then and then life just keep, listen, the bad, bad things will happen. It's just inevitable. And I feel that way too in this day. I feel a bit overwhelmed by 
health problems with family, by losing people, by my own feeling my age, feeling, you know, that's sort of like life's going to keep going that way. So I can either be beaten down by the depression of that and like sink into the swamp of sadness. Um, Or what I love about this show is that there's a love story within that. That's sort of like, there's still magic that can unfold, even though these are the circumstances. And even though life feels this way, and even if you feel like this is a a very hard chore, that there is still some, you know, there's a magic scene in the middle of the show. And I, I just think that's, for me personally, it's like the kind of optimism and a realistic optimism that I really appreciate right now. You're talking about the uh, the first date? The yes. First date? Uh, yeah. <laughs> I love that. And now I want to recreate that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's the, the ad for the show. Ad for the show. If is- we sold anything in the show, I think that's what we sell. <laughs> Selling psilocybin. <laughs> yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Big edge. Yeah. I mean, I, wh- I think one of the first questions was like that you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, was like, did you have to use of any of your tools? Yeah. And so, well, I really, before I got to the first rehearsal and I was reading this, I was doing another play and I felt s- like so connected to that last character. And when I read the script, I was like, I don't know how to do this. I have no idea how to do this. And I was like really worried about it, actually. Um, because when I was first offered this, Play, I was offered Trish like by accident and then I was like oh my god I'm gonna play Susie okay so Trish is the but younger sister Trish is the oldest oh the oldest yeah, right She's but the not as written it's confusing it's it's a confusing <laughs> yes, it is as it's written. A- <laughs> the first one we see <laughs> so we we talk about this all the time I thought I was the oldest forever this no. is insane that's Trish so is the oldest sorry to interrupt but we have to say it's a funny story Andrea being Andrea, which is why she says she's not like Susie. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> Trish is the oldest sister. This is written. We have talked about it. Susie is the middle sister. Fran is the youngest. And then the other day we were talking like a week ago, we've been doing the show now for two months or something. And she went, well, you know, well, Susie's the oldest. And I was like, <laughs> excuse me? You think you're the oldest? You are the oldest. But you know, that's how Susie would see herself. That's and right. That's she how, is the most man, responsible. <laughs> she is the most responsible. No, I, I did. But to, to get back to your question, I think that uh, when I came into the first rehearsal, Cecily was so present and I immediately liked her like the second mm-hmm. I sat down so much because as you can see, she has a very dry sense of humor, which I appreciate. And a whole lot of other things going on. And they were immediately present in her acting. And when we got to that scene, I was like, oh, shit, she can act. So I was like, I'm fine. I just have to be with her and I'll be fine. I knew what to do because of what she was doing. And that's the, that's the thing is that we don't act in a vacuum. I mean, she just did a one-person show, which is really challenging. But we don't act in a vacuum, you know. We act with other people. And if an actor shows up and they're like, amazing and fantastic and totally connected your job's basically done yeah that's actually one of the things too that that you know over the years of learning that being a good actor is what is it what do they say it's 80 percent, 70 percent listening whatever it is like all you got to do is just react authentically to whatever your partner is giving you in the scene and if and if you're with somebody who who is connected then they're going to bring you in that much more and it just it's this compound energy that sucks in the audience and that's what all of Brooklyn Laundry does. I mean, like, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking back again to my experience seeing the show, and I, I just went, I was leaning in literally and figuratively the whole time. Didn't know I was like, is a bad thing? Is death gonna come? Mm-hmm. Is happiness gonna come? Are they gonna get together? What's going on? And then, uh, all of this at the end, I'm like, well, you know what? It's not, it's not a Disney ending, but it's happy mm-hmm. in its own way because mm-hmm. it's real life. Does that make sense? I think it's a yeah. I think it's a very happy ending. Shanley also like he uh, he's just a brilliant writer, and he writes really incredible women. I don't. I could relate to all three of these women actually, like a hundred percent at different times in my life and different circumstances. Could see myself being Trish, Susie, and and certainly I think everybody, a lot of women my age, relate to Fran 
because of what Cecily was saying. And it's crazy that John Patrick Shanley wrote that because I haven't quite seen that story told so specifically because mm. the way that our mothers lived in the world is very different f from how, and women our age, uh, late 30s, early 40s, are trying to navigate a whole, I, every, Cecily really spoke to it uh, about losing three years, the pandemic, and then going, oh shit, well, how I need, I, I'm behind, I'm behind, this feeling of really constantly being behind, and then it's over. I mean, that's kind of what the place, well, sorry, not to give anything away, but um, I don't know how Shanley was able to really get, do you know Cecily? No. I feel like he really got that existential crisis that we're having, women my age. Mm -hmm. Right. Not all, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm speaking in vast generalizations, but I can only speak for myself and say I can relate well, to the characters. But I've also, there's been people that aren't women that have said, I really relate with, Fran you know, yeah. my place in life right now is like, I have this responsibility thrust on me. That's just family. Yeah. So I think that is a thing everyone can relate to of all of all ages and whatever your unfortunate or fortunate circumstances are. Yeah, that's that's interesting. I mean, I'm 43. My parents are aging. My dad's health is not as where I would like to see it. Like it's not mm -hmm. doing well, right? And like we're now starting to see uh, uh, all these things happen to us that as as people who are younger. Like in my 20s, I was fortunate enough to feel like I was invincible. I didn't have the trauma. <laughs> yeah, no. That was, yeah. or fam family issues or trauma or anything that, that um, I'm now experiencing or have seen just living a normal day to day existence, especially in New York. And nothing, you know, I mean, like you could say the worst thing that's ever happened to me is I had my laundry lost in Brooklyn. You know, <laughs> like everyone's had their laundry lost <laughs> in a laundromat. Cecily, what you were saying, I think now is the point where this is middle age speaking statistics in averages and we're halfway done and do we feel like we've done enough will we ever feel good enough that's the existential reason why i have this podcast why i want to have conversations so i want to learn and talk to as many people and learn and have as much conversation as i can so to put this out in the world for everyone to experience and be better from and i think also, from a, a creative standpoint, that's why a lot of creatives have to create. It's their method of expressing, of of being remembered, of having a legacy. Mm -hmm. Cecily, uh, I was reading too that you have an you have a book, a memoir. This will all be over soon, um, mm -hmm. which talks about your own sort of loss of somebody close as well. And did that play into? like sort of the decision to leave SNL and kind of move on to new things? Oh, for sure. I mean, I think that, listen, in January 2020, I lost my 30-year-old cousin uh, to brain cancer, whose name is Owen, and uh, which was another reason this show came along. I was like, whoa, this has got brain cancer, we've got an Owen, and there's a lot of ties to the theater. So it just was all those like, this is a sign, you should do this. But so my world was like kind of flipped upside down in January. And then two months later, the rest of the world was flipped upside down. And then I also thought like there's what a great guide for me right now with the unknown of COVID, like the unknown of living with brain cancer uh, and how he did that with such positivity. And I also like I met my current partner and, and now we're engaged. And I was like, I don't know that I would have been like open to that. I don't know that I felt like my edges got softened a little bit. Hmm. That was sort of like, I'm going to be more open to love. I'm going to be more open to being vulnerable to I'm going to choose work that I care about and not maybe try to be less hard on myself and not, I mean, that's an impossible task, but I think there were lessons to be learned in COVID too. And really writing was just kind of a great therapy for me and was like, let me try to find magical stories within this and give it some purpose or purposes around just some, some meaning in like this very otherwise, again, it's like I could just drown in this and I don't want to drown in this. Hmm. Yeah, I guess, it, yeah, it's a way, it's a way to express. It's a way to express to, to cope. And and I think just like, yeah, listen, we're actors, we we do this, this work means everything to us. This work is our life. I think all of us would say that's the number one 
thing about me is I'm an actor. I, I like to perform. I like to to feel publicly, to go through catharsis. I like to laugh. I like to write and share things. And so I, I think it's just like, and in the worst of situations, being open to an opportunity to do that and, um, and not making these rigid rules like, well, here's what I'm supposed to do. I did SNL. This, this is what I'm supposed to do next. This is what my career should look like. This is what my life should look like because I've always, I've always fallen short of those, those markers that I have set for myself or that I have felt have been set or society has set. A million people can say nasty things about you. People can write your narrative online. And I've always fallen short of that. And it's like, but I'm, I've been generally, I feel pretty lucky to be where I am. So screw those markers. Hang on, everybody. We're just going to take a quick break. All right. Now we're back. I feel like every character that actors do, it lives with them for the rest of the actor's life because you're putting yourself into that character and, and then that character is imprinted on you. Yeah, I mean, well, I, I think a lot of, I, you know, I had a, oh, God. I had a Juilliard classmate who passed away at 25, really young, just a couple years out of school. I think about him every night that I do the play. You know, these, it's, life is so, I mean, life is so unexpected. And you really do, it's why, it's why we stick around, because you never really do know what's around the corner. And yet I have, I live with a lot of fear and anxiety. And I mean, actors, I think, do. But I think people live with a lot more fear and anxiety than we'd like to admit because we have this idea of having to... Pre- it's getting better. Not when, when we were growing up, we are in the same generation. You know, the emphasis on mental health or that conversation isn't what it is today, which is fantastic. COVID made me rethink everything because I never thought that I was... I always thought as an actor, if I'm, I'm not working, it's just because I'm not getting a job. I never thought the theater would be, you know, right. gone. And I was involved in the first Broadway show back from COVID. And there was, you know, everybody was wearing masks. We were testing like every other day. It was, it still feels a little surreal and I'm still trying to navigate. But I really thought during COVID, if I never act again, I just want to be happy. I mean, I got to this place where I was just like, I want to find joy. What does it mean to have joy and a cup of coffee? You know, like that, the simple things of being alive. For Susie, unfortunately, I mean, this is a little subtextually. I'm not even sure Shanley wrote this. But for all of these of all of these characters, I think grappling with our own mortality is such a... I was going to use a curse word, but... Um, Go ahead. I was going to say mind fuck. You know, grappling with our mortality is such a mind fuck. And if you go to see movies and the plays, at some point, most characters, even in comedy, are doing it. They're trying to, we're trying to like navigate it, figure it out, try to find peace with grief. You know, it's, somebody said recently, someone be kind because someone is always grieving something at any point in their life. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true. I just think it's so true. And I can relate to that 100%. I do think that meeting Cecily has been a really big deal. And having this experience has been a really positive one. Mm-hmm. And meeting Cecily, too, like, as we go through life, I feel like, I'm like, oh, I could see us as 80-year-old women, you know, <laughs> going to the theater, <laughs> stealing some, like you know, buns on the table and taking them home to our dogs. You know, you do, life keeps going. The reason it keeps going is because we meet people. She met Owen, Fran meets Owen. There's always something or someone around the corner that's going to change our life or change our perspective as we lose people. Yeah. There's there's always seemingly innocuous encounters, decisions, something that turns, that is a failure in the moment that turns into a success that, that just keeps you going. And I I really enjoy exploring those conversations too, of diving into the like, oh, that failed. I was devastated at the time. I never thought I could go on. And But because of that, not doing that, I was able to do the other things instead. I was able to learn. I, I then instead met that person or had that experience. And you just become better people because of your failures. So, and I, and I always like to go back to, in these types of conversations and quote, uh, Andre DeShields when he won his, his Tony award 
a couple of years ago when he said, you know, what he's, however, the age he is in, a man of a certain age winning his first Tony Award for a, a, a lifelong career in the theater. And he says, the top of one mountain is the bottom of the next. Never stop, you know, never stop moving forward. I, I, that's, that has always stuck with me so much because you're, you're right. And then I add to it too. And I say, don't forget that when you're the top of the first mountain, turn around and look and see how far you've come first, but then keep moving to the next mountain. <laughs> mm -hmm. Cause you still have put in the energy and you've gotten to where you are because of your hard work. So. And everybody's mountain is different, you know, yeah. because you're, you're climbing it in different climates. How about that analogy, Sess? Wow. Right. Um, no, but it's true. It's like you can't you can't compare yourself to other people. You have to climb your own mountain, you know, and you know, bring somebody with you. It's true. I think I I love teaching acting, like Cecily was saying. I did that out of necessity during COVID, and because I had the time to do it, mm -hmm. and I love it. I'll do it for the rest of my life. I'm sure that's what I'll do in retirement. Okay, so let's switch over to uh, something a little bit funner than talking about death and existential crises. Um, okay, so uh, I have a little- No can do. <laughs> no. <laughs> All right, so I've got a brand new segment that I like to do. Oh, I like I like to do it now. This is the only second time I've done it. It's brand new. Um, I'm gonna, you're gonna give me a random number, which is between one and 10, which is gonna correspond to a popular musical. And then in 60 seconds or less, you have to give me the the plot oh this is all cecily oh no i actually i don't know popular musicals and i'm gonna say nine and i feel like then are you gonna say the musical nine no 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 no. i just have okay. i have musicals listed one through oh you have one okay. through ten and where did my i lost my sorry i tried to guess your thing and i was wrong cecily. And this is gonna be embarrassing for us oh this is good this is good this that makes it all the better okay so nine cool we're we'll gonna find out why schmigadoon got canceled <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so number nine is Wicked. You have 60 seconds on the clock and go. 60 seconds remaining. Uh, Wicked is my my beloved Kristen Chenoweth and Adina Menzel, original cast. It's uh, the Wicked Witch of the, what was she, the East? And, and um, Glinda, the Good Witch and the Bad Witch. And they meet in the College of Witches. 45 seconds remaining. And he turns out, you know, the bad witch is bad because she's green. She's misunderstood. They become friends. They join forces. And then there's a wizard that I'm less interested in. Yeah, Stephen Schwartz. Uh, well, okay, it's Oz. 30 it's seconds just, it's, remaining. It's Yes, it's a female friendship, empowerment. You know, we're not so different. So you've Even described the show. What been. happens in the show? Oh, well, they go, listen. It's been, I saw it 10 years ago. It's 15 seconds remaining. Oh my God. Listen, I, here's the thing. I signed an NDA because of the new movie. Does anybody <laughs> die? Isn't that a safe answer? <laughs> oh, that's a safe answer. Five, Popular. Four, three. <laughs> what happens two, though? One. I can't remember and what they happens. Meet, they make friends at the school. I, and then, I mean, that's really they make they make I friends. Uh, it's a it's a story of prejudice because she's different. Everybody, she's green. Everybody, she's green. That's all that makes her different. Everyone picks on her. She ends up becoming the bad guy because that's what everyone wants her to be. And but she and Glinda are secretly besties. And then she flies away and defies gravity. Ah. Oh right, it's a very hard song. I just did it. What I was crushed it? it? What's my favorite thing? Oh, uh, what is it? What is what did John Travolta to say? Um, uh, uh, a Dean, a Dean P P P Pedrad, what's his name? No, and she had to sing the song for Let It Go, which is apparently like a very hard song to sing. Yeah, and she was about to sing it and got introduced. And he said, and it's because of the setup, too. And it was like, there is only the one no. person that can do this, the one and only. <laughs> A Dean for sale or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Adele Dazeem. Sorry, I guess Adele, Adele, Adele Dazeem. Adele Dazeem. There you go. Adele Dazeem. Please welcome the wickedly talented one and only Adele Dazeem. The one and only Adele Dazeem. Adele Dazeem. <laughs> and it cuts to her and she's like, huh? <laughs> <laughs> she's got to sing the hardest song ever. But she does it. That's a profession right there. True profession. It's amazing. 
Um, okie dokie. So three standard closing questions I used to wrap up. Wait, uh, Andrea didn't have to do her numbers. Oh, you want to know? Oh, oh, I thought you were going to. Okay. Yeah, you're right. You're right. All right. So one, I'm not living in that shame alone. Okay. One, one through, uh, eight big, big three. age. Three. Okay. Um, where'd my 60 second timer go? I'm bringing that back. But you have to help. Cause I helped out with that one says how I don't remember your help. <laughs> All right. 60 seconds on the clock. You have to tell me the plot now to Book of Mormon, go. 60 seconds remaining. I don't, actually, I knew you were going to say that. But I will say that, like, uh, what I know of it, even though I've never seen it, never heard it, I do know that my friend, my good friend's partner of many years is in it, John, and I will get to go see it. 45 um, seconds remaining. White guy Mormon goes to Africa. His life has changed. Two of them. The two friends. Two, two white friends. Another great Mormon, show about friendship. Two white Mormon guys go to Africa. Josh Gad, Andrew Rannells. Right? And seconds they go to reading. Africa and their life is changed and their mind is open. Uh, written I just by made, Trey I'm, Parker and Matt Stone. Written by Trey Parker. Literally, I'm just making this up. Am I right? Don't they bring Mormonism to Africa? Well, of course. They're missionaries. They're, seconds, they're missionaries. They go to Africa, but then they learn things. They think they know everything, but they learn things, and their mind is open <laughs> by the Africans. It's a story told and told Five. and told. Am I Old wrong? Three. As old as time. And it's one. really funny. <laughs> <laughs> it is very funny. <laughs> and it's really, really funny. I actually haven't seen Book of Mormon in probably 10 years. I've never seen it. Okay, me see. This is where I'm at. Have I you saw seen it, Cecily? 10 years ago. Yeah, I saw it. I saw it on a Sunday matinee with my brother after after at SNL. So I was like, uh, you know, dead. Actually but I laughed a lot. Yeah. It, was, it was as funny as they say. It is. It is. And I, I think they've updated it post-COVID to make it less offensive, but then mm. it's still, I don't know how you can still be Book of Mormon in South Park and not be offensive. Right, right, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Okay. Well, lesson for trying. Now are you ready for your three closing questions? Oh, okay. yeah. All right, we're going to go back and forth here. Um, Cecily, we'll start with you. Very simply, it's just what motivates you. Um, getting to share joy, number one, and then even sometimes joy comes in different forms and it's if it's letting people cry about letting people feel something it's so it's the sharing of it andrea what motivates you that's a good question uh other people motivate me i mean no that's not true uh i i i agree with that i think getting into a shared space what, and telling stories motivates me comparing stories motivates me and sharing joy like what Cecily said, it's the same thing. All right. That There's just so much ugliness right now. And it's like, I don't think I'm a person that can change the world in big ways. But it's like, if you could change the 30 feet around you someday, even, you know, if you can make people smile. I know what it's like when people have made me smile and it means a lot. Mm. All right, Andrew, we'll stick with you for this next one. What advice would you give to your younger self and younger people listening now starting out down a similar path? Oh, uh -huh. Well, when they tell you a life in the theater is going to be hard, believe them. <laughs> when they tell you it's going to be worth it, believe them. Um, both of those things are true. And I think if I could go to my younger self and just be like, you're beautiful, you're fine. Get off your case. Stop being a perfectionist. Stop with the melodrama. You know, just <laughs> it's going to be OK. You're going to be fine. It's life is going to be hard. You're going to it. You're going to feel a lot of loss. It's going to be difficult, but it's all going to be worth it. And just keep going. Whatever you do, just keep going. Mm. That's what I would say to my younger self. Cecily, what would you say? Winning lotto numbers, baby. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I know it's tough because I'm like, where would I be if I hadn't done all the thing, you know, with without all the heartbreaks? And so it's, I, I guess, similarly, like, yes, you'll be, you will be okay. There will tomorrow, you will smile again on days that felt hard to smile. Yeah. All right. So we'll start again with Cecily here. Last question. If you could only see one show for the rest of your life, but you can see it as many times as you want, what would you see? Oh, Andrew, you're making a face. <laughs> I am. 
That's an impossible question because I would I would start to hate it. And I like so many shows and I like to be surprised. A play or a TV show? Anything. This is, uh, this is the hardest question. It is so hard. Okay, uh, then I guess I will. It, if there could be new episodes, this is, I'm just going to answer the thing that we have been watching lately, although I've watched it forever. I'm very into love on the spectrum. Mm. So I'm going to, my answer is a reality show, but it's not really a reality show. It's a docu-series yeah. and it's beautiful. It's so and beautiful. it's funny and it's lovely and it's wonderful. Andrea, what would you say? Uh, yeah, I would agree with Cecily's, but that's also just because that's what we're watching right now. I'm also, as Cecily will tell you, obsessed with, uh, I'm watching The Sopranos for the first time. I mean, I'd kill myself if I had to watch that for the rest of my life, but it's incredible television, and I'm totally blown away. And uh, Yeah, we need a variation. That's a hard question. I don't want to... Pri- then it becomes a prison sentence. Honestly, anything with Judy Garland like, is so comforting to me because it's like, meet me in St. Louis, my childhood. It reminds me of my grandmother. It's like warm oh. and fuzzy feeling. It'd be something like that. All right. Well, where can we find you both online? Cecily, we'll start with you. Uh, you can only find me on Instagram. And I guess it's at my name. I don't know. And and don't go looking for much. <laughs> <laughs> Andrea. I yeah, just posted like, about my dog today. It's my it's my dog Scotch a day. Aww. Sorry. Oh, ring. it is. Mm-hmm. Aww. Um check it out on my Instagram, guys. At Chesley Strong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I guess you could g- go to Google. No, I'm just kidding. Uh yeah, Instagram. Instagram. Basically. And if you want coaching and teaching. And your OnlyFans, right? Yeah, your OnlyFans. You f- how don't <laughs> out me? My name's not Siglowski on OnlyFans. <laughs> it's, it's Big Ange. It's Big Ange. Yeah, no. How do, if we want to connect with you and be coached, how can we find you? Oh, uh, you know what? Instagram's the best way to do that. All right. Is that terrible? Should I like figure something out? Reach out no, to me. Insta- you after this. Yeah, reach out to me. Yeah. I'm gonna. I'm gonna help She's you set up a website. She's a great coach. Uh, let me just say, and this is not BSing. Andrea is truly one of the greatest actors and actor minds ever, and anyone would be lucky to be coached by her. Your sweetheart. Thanks, sis. Aww. So get more of me on Threads, Instagram, TikTok, and Facebook. I'm there. Leave a rating and review wherever you're listening. Tell your friends you just listen to a great podcast. That's how this grows. Thanks, you. Thanks, yous. Thank you to Jukebox <laughs> the Ghost for the intro and outro music. And Cecily and Andrea, thank you so much. This has been a really enlightening conversation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks for having us. Yes, yeah, thank you. Take a deep breath. Make the world a little colorful.